Hey guys, how are ya? I'm just leaning back on this chair. I'm at the home of our brother Idiotai. His YouTube page is Idiotai Apologetics. Subscribe to it. Support this brother and pray. He's going to be coming out with videos in Jesus' name. He and his wife have been a gracious host, letting me stay here while I'm in California. What's up, everyone? How you doing? I know I just announced this last minute, but you guys know I said around 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So let's wait for a few more faces to show up. We'll continue my series. Yep, 4 p.m. So you're also California area, 1611? So continue my series on proving Jesus is not the spirit creature called the Archangel Michael. <clears throat> so, friend, I'm in your area. If you want to meet, let me know. I'll be here, God willing, to the 15th. So if you want to meet, let me know, friend. It'd be nice to meet you. How are you, Gloria? Gloria, Gloria, I think they got your number. Gloria, I think they got your alias. Gloria, you've been living under. Gloria, calling Gloria. Uh, I will debate Gino Jennings anytime, any place, and destroy and decimate his blasphemies by the power of the triumph God, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yep. Well, you got to send for me if you want me to come to England. You guys. You guys got to send for me. All right. Let me just do this. All right. Just waiting for a few more faces to show up. What's up, Sneakers Corner? Ain't you also from England? Anyone wants me to come? Anyone wants me to come and visit them? Send for me. Listen, we're in full-time ministry, right? If you want me to come, all we ask is, hey, if, well, again, if you can't afford it, that's fine. We'll find other ways. Get me the plane ticket. I'll be there. We're just waiting for some brothers and sisters to show up and pray as we're waiting for them to show up. The Holy Spirit energizes me, washes me in the blood of Jesus Christ, crucify our flesh, destroy our flesh, and just give us power and life from the Spirit. I need to be energized spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. Sneakers Corner. Uh, SDA view on this subject. Well, you have... Pastor Douglas Batchelor of Amazing Facts, that is a Trinitarian. So there's nothing to refute in the sense that if he believes Jesus is eternal, uncreated, God Almighty, second person of the Godhead, then I'm not really refuting him. I'm refuting those who believe that the Archangel Michael is a creature and that Jesus is, is that creature, the Archangel Michael, right? So... Yeah, see, Medic for Christ comes out of the SDA. Corns, how did you do that? Yes, but the fact is, if you are a Trinitarian, you believe Jesus is God Almighty, he's uncreated, but that one of his offices or names happened to be the Archangel Michael, that's fine. I don't believe that. I don't think it's scriptural, but that's okay. Because I believe there's plenty of evidence to show that the Archangel Michael is distinguished from the Lord Jesus Christ. Samuel, you're not thinking through the implication. You're assuming Michael is a creature. But if Michael happens to be an office physician of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord Jesus Christ is uncreated eternal, then Michael is not a creature. Right? No spaces between the word and coma marks. Okay, hold on. Quarrens Chamber. All right, folks, welcome. I'm waiting for our brother Protestant believer. A few more faces. Pray for me. Pray God will energize me and fill me with life and power from the Spirit. I'm tired today. It's like I feel like I'm getting beat down all of a sudden. Will you bring going to Benjamin? When you send for me, Sneakers Corner. No, St. Dennis, I won't go over numbers 23 19. You see the the title of the talk, St. Dennis? Is God a man? No, that's not the title, right? It's, it's Jesus the Archangel Michael. 
Isn't it amazing? See, now, I, you know, you offended me again. See, I get easily offended because I got issues, so I'm asking the Holy Spirit to sanctify me. Why would a Christian ask me to deal with a text that's not relevant to the topic when he sees the name of the, to uh, the topic? How are you, Glenn? I arrived at Protestant Evangelical via Douglas Patchler. What were you, DH uh, DHC? So let him let him refute it. And what's the point? What does that what does that got to do with me? What concern do I have with that Jewish guy? Right? What's that got to do with me? Praise Yahovah. Sorry, guys. There's going to be a delay. Some people are going to get bored. Guys, bear with me. We're just waiting for Protestant believers to show up. First and last, I guess he's not here. We'll see because he usually posts verses. If not, I'll just begin. Yes, yes. Douglas ba Bachelor, pretty good. If you've been following me, St. Dennis, and if you've been going to the website and reading my articles, and if you've been actually looking through my YouTube channel, I have several articles on Numbers 2319, right? Several articles on Numbers 2319 that God is not a man. Sam in Indonesia, Abdul, so proud, said, Jesus be God, become God only when I have no idea what you're saying here. Edward, if you've been following me for the last 20 years, yeah, let's say 20 years, I speak primarily on Christian topics. I focus primarily on the doctrines of the Christian faith and the Holy Bible. Do you know why, Edward? Can I tell you why? Because Christians are ignorant and biblically illiterate. So what benefit is it if I spend... 95% of the time attacking Islam and the Quran, that's not going to make anyone a believer in Jesus Christ, nor will it strengthen Christians in their faith because one of the largest segments of apostates from Islam happens to be secular humanist atheists. A lot of Muslims don't turn to Christ. They become atheists, agnostics. So, we need to refute Islam, expose Islam, as we need to refute and expose atheism and secularism and the cults. But we need to spend more time on what the Bible teaches, what are the core doctrines of the Christian faith, and why we should believe in the Bible, right? So when you say, have I taken a break, Orthodox want tend to be to some extent biblically alert because we don't empathize scripture reading yes exactly edward in fact when you say i've taken a break well just go back read my articles watch the videos i spend more time talking about the bible answering challenges to scripture to the core doctrines of the christian faith right such as the trinity christ being god who became man the divine personhood of the holy spirit the authority of scriptures, the sufficiency of scriptures. In fact, if I ask basic questions of, of my brothers and sisters here now, I'm afraid how many won't be able to answer. If I were to ask specific questions right now, specific questions about what you're supposed to believe as a Christian, I'm afraid how many won't be able to answer because a lot of Christians want to focus on refuting Islam or the cults but not spend enough time studying their own faith what they're supposed to believe and why and the authority of scripture right here in fact I'm gonna I'm gonna do it I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out a question gonna, and this will tell me how many of these brothers sisters here who've been following us for years some of you have been following David Wood Anthony Rogers myself for years Christian Prince for years okay so you should be able to answer this question. You should be able to answer this question. But now I'm going to scare myself because you won't answer the question correctly. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong. This will tell me whether our efforts have been in vain or God has been pleased to take our efforts and move you guys to understand these issues, understand what you're supposed to believe. So are you ready? 
I'm going to ask you the most basic question a Muslim will ask you concerning the deity of Christ. Are you ready now? Here's a test. You're going to confirm to me why we need to spend more time on the Bible, what it teaches, and why to believe it than attacking Islam. Okay. This is a question that Muslims ask all the time. Okay, Edward, we'll see how ready you are. Okay. okay. All the time. Okay. Show me where Jesus says, I am God, or worship me in those exact words. Show me where Jesus says, I am God, or where he says, worship me in those exact words. Go ahead. Praise the Lord for Black Smurf and Nada. You make me proud. Medic, show me where Paul says, I am not God. Do not worship me. 1611, show me where Paul says, I am not God. Not worship me. Okay, now. Nada and Black Smurf, you bless my heart. You made me happy. Nada and Black Smurf, you bless me heart. And made me happy, as did Marion Grant Bruheim and Lewis. Praise the Lord Jesus. Our efforts have not been in vain. Right? Do you know why? Jesus never says it in those exact words. Those of you who try to answer by saying Mark 14, 62, where he says that he's a son of man or revelation, you didn't hear the question and you haven't been following us that carefully. Jesus never says in those exact words, I am God, or where he says, worship me. The fact that there were a handful of you that answered correctly, that blesses my heart. That means David Wood's efforts, Anthony Rogers' efforts, James White's efforts, my efforts have not been in vain. All glory to the triumph God. Praise the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Hold on. You here, Protestant believer? I don't know where you're at. We're waiting for you. It blessed my heart. Now it gives me confidence, right? All right. Now I'm going to talk about something different. Okay, Protestant is here. Praise God. We're, all, we're about to begin. I'm going to ask another question. Hey, Ken, is that you, Ken? Is that my buddy, Ken, bro? SAFC days? It's not so much that Jesus needs to prove it to himself, but to prove it to others. No, Sai Christian, he didn't say, I am God in those exact words. Now, you definitely don't listen to anyone. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question. This is for Protestants, because remember, I'm a Protestant. Let me repeat, for the record, I'm a Protestant who affirms sola scriptura, sola fide. I know there are Orthodox Catholics here who don't accept it. That's fine. This is a challenge for the Protestant evangelicals. Are you ready? Protestant evangelicals, are you ready? Who, uh, the Protestants of Angel, you ready for my challenge? Say, Christian, that's not the same thing as saying, I am God in those exact words. You're trying but failing. Keep driving, buddy. Okay. Protestants, you believe in sola scriptura. Let me define the term sola scriptura. Sola scriptura means that the Bible is the only infallible, infallible rule of faith. It's not the only rule of faith. Guys, pay attention, please, because we're going to get into the topic. This is all warm-up to get you guys ready. It's not the only rule of faith. It's the only infallible rule of faith, meaning there are other authorities, but these authorities are fallible. They're, they're not inspired. They're not perfect, and they're subject to the ultimate authority of Scripture because the Scripture is infallible, meaning completely reliable, free of error, because it is the voice of God to the church. The only infallible rule of faith. So now, Protestants, where does the Bible say, where does the Bible say that the Bible is the inspired word of God? When I say Bible, I'm not just saying Old Testament. Where does the Bible say the Bible is the inspired word of God? Not just Old Testament, folks. Anyone? Where does the Bible say the Bible is 
the inspired word of God. Say, I know you guys are going to quote 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. You didn't pay attention to the question. Let me repeat the question again. Where does the Bible say the Bible, not just the Old Testament, not just the Old Testament, but Old and New Testaments are the inspired scripture of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, if you read verse 15, 2 Timothy 3.16, if you read verse 15, it says, To Timothy, how Timothy has known the Holy Scriptures from childhood. So someone is going to tell you, John 17.17 17 doesn't prove your point. John 17.17 17 speaks of the Word of God. Unless you want to limit the Word of God, the Word of God to the written Word, you're begging the question. So let's not beg the question here. Let's try this again. And 2 Peter 1, 20, 21 is speaking of the prophetic scriptures, meaning the Old Testament writings, what the prophets brought. Let me repeat my question because you guys are not answering. So that means you're not listening well. Let's try it again. I need you to listen well. Listen. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul reminds Timothy of the sacred scriptures that he has known since childhood. Well, there was no New Testament writings when Timothy was a child. So someone's going to tell you that 2 Timothy 3.16 is not referring to the New Testament. There was no New Testament. It's talking about the Old Testament being God-breathed. So now they're going to challenge you. Where does the New Testament claim to be God-breathed? Get my point? You understand the challenge? This is why as Christians, we need to be good listeners, listen just as well as we speak. Yeah, 16.11, and if you read 2 Peter 1, 19 and 21, it's talking about the prophetic writing, the prophetic witness that was produced by holy men of God, guided by the Holy Spirit. So again, they're limited to the Old Testament. You get my point? So the challenge for those of you who believe in Sola Scripture, which I do, is to show where the Bible refers to everything that God would produce as Scripture being inspired, breathed out by God, right? That's the challenge. I've met the challenge in my articles. I've written articles on this on AnsweringIslam.net. Lord willing, in a future session, I can discuss where the Bible describes not just the Old Testament, but all the books that God, in his perfect wisdom, would produce as falling under the category of inspired scripture. Right? That was just a challenge. Now, you understand now why I stated I prefer to focus on, now Romans 9, 4 to 5, Protestant is referring to the gifts the blessings, the privileges given to Israel, right? Past. Yep, Bill Thompson gave you one. 2 Peter 3, 15, 16. Thank you, Bill Thompson. Bill Thompson just gave you one example where Peter says that Paul wrote his epistles with the wisdom given to him and men who are untaught and unstable in mind pervert Paul's letters as they do other scripture. Bill Thompson, thank you. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Excellent, brother. There at least you can make a case that whatever Paul wrote was scripture, which he produced by the wisdom that God gave him. Thank you, brother. Right? So now, point being, here's my challenge. Do you see? Well, the rest of scripture, they'll tell you it's referring to the Old Testament there, Bill Thompson, which means that Paul's letters are now placed on the level of the Old Testament. Now, but coming back to the issue, do you see why Christians, I don't care what your denomination, what your branch is, do you see why? Okay, but Edward, am I talking to liberals and critical scholars that dispute 2 Peter? Edward, do you dispute 2 Peter? Why would you bring up a red herring? I'm talking to Christians who believe in the Bible, specifically Protestants who accept the canon of the Bible that they have and believe 2 Peter was written by Peter, right? Can they show from those scriptures where the Bible says that even the New Testament is inspired, why would you toss out a red herring? Okay. 
Okay. Am I asking the Abduls again, Edward? Let me repeat myself again. Maybe I wasn't clear the first two times. Edward, third time. Why would you toss out a red herring when my question is not directed to Muslims or Bart Ehrman or liberal New Testament scholars who don't believe in the Bible to begin with? In fact, Edward, did you not cite 2 Timothy 3 and 2 Peter 1.21? I know you cited 2 Peter 1.21, right, Edward? Did you also raise up 2 Timothy 3? I just want to be clear. Did you? Ken Parker, that's referring to the Old Testament again. Old Testament. So now why, Edward, did you appeal to 2 Peter 1.21 to prove your case but then knock down 2 Peter's witness to Paul's letters because people would question it. So why did you quote 2 Peter to begin with? You see the problem I'm having with you right now, my brother? Okay, so if you know that's what Abduls would say, why did you quote 2 Peter 1.21? Why did you cite 2 Peter 1.21 with John 17.17 17 to make your case when you knew that Abduls was going to question 2 Peter 1.21? So why was 2 Peter 1 good to answer the question, but then when Bill Thompson quoted 2 Peter to show that Peter called Paul's letter scripture, you now question 2 Peter. Was it because you're upset that you didn't make that argument? And so now you wanted to shut down Bill Thompson's argument to make yourself look good? See, the guy still doesn't get it. Edward's not getting it, is he? And we're going to begin in a minute. I'm just waiting for some more regular. I'm going to repeat it to everyone else. Guys, help Edward see what he just did. Edward quoted 2 Peter 1.21 to show that the Bible is inspired. When I said that's referring to the Old Testament. And then Bill Thompson mentioned 2 Peter calling Paul's letter scripture. Then Edward all of a sudden convenience says, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But they're going to question 2 Peter. So can you help Edward see if they're going to question 2 Peter, why did he then appeal to 2 Peter to answer the question if he knows they're going to question 2 Peter? Can you help Edward see? This guy, Sai Christian, I swear when I see you, I'm going to sidekick you. Okay. Now, coming back to the issue, why did I start off with these questions? Let me explain to you. Why I started off with these questions. Oh, so then when he answered a Christian, then you answered for an Abdul. Edward, you know, you're really pushing me. You may, you may have a short lifespan in my room. You know that, right? Because you see your dishonesty. You answered as a Christian. But when Bill Thompson was answering as a Christian, you went all Abdul on him. Okay. Let's come back to the issue here. But Black Smurf, maybe you're not getting it, my brother, either. He didn't play devil's advocate when he used 2 Peter to prove his position. Why now play devil's advocate to shut down the argument of a brother who used 2 Peter to make a good argument if it's not out of envy and jealousy that he didn't answer correctly? See, that's what I'm exposing him. The envy, the jealousy that, darn it, another Christian got the answer right, not me. So let me now shoot down his argument. See the point now? See, I know what I'm doing. You get my point? Okay. But coming to the point here, coming to the point here. Psalm, brother, if you tell me let's move on, I'm not going to move on. Okay. Okay. Let me let me share some with you guys. Guys, you by now you should know. I'm not here to win a popularity contest, contest, right? And I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but I'm not going to tickle your ears. I'm not going to pull punches. Believe me, you won't offend me. Let me just be honest with you. You won't offend me if you don't come back. As I said yesterday, I'm going to repeat it again. I'm going to repeat it again so I can be clear, so I don't repeat myself again. God raises up different teachers with different personalities and temperaments to draw different people. Not everyone is going to be drawn to James White or me or David Wood. Some people are going to like James White. Some won't. 
Some people are going to like me. Some won't. Some are going to like David Wood. Some won't. Some are going to like John MacArthur. Some won't. That's the beauty of God. He raises up a variety of Christian voices with their issues and imperfections so that no one person becomes the center of attention, but all eyes for, turn to Jesus. So if you don't like my style, you don't like me being upfront and quote unquote harsh, friend, leave. I'm not for you. Let me be honest. God crucify my flesh, destroy my flesh. I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I'm going to be honest. I'm not for you. Leave. Go find someone else. God doesn't need me, and I'm not the be-all and end-all of Christianity. I am not the Savior. Jesus is. James White may be more for you. God bless that brother. Christian Prince may be more for you. Anthony Rogers. Go to them. You don't like me delaying or the way I do? Leave. Okay? Just want to make clear. Don't stay. I'm helping you. Move on. I'm not for you. Okay? With that said, now we got everyone here. I wish I was. Pray I can be a tenth of Paul. Love Jesus the way Paul did. Worship Jesus the way Paul did. Have the wisdom that Paul did and the faithfulness that Paul did and the willingness to die for Jesus. I pray I become like Paul, right? And by the way, for the record, let me share something with you. Paul, you can tell from the book of Acts that he wasn't, quote unquote, a nice guy because you don't st start riots and fights being a nice guy and effeminate. Wherever Paul preached, Riots occurred. What does that tell you about Paul's style? What does that tell you about Paul's style? Right? Read the book of Acts. If he was an effeminate, nice guy, he wouldn't get stoned, beat, imprisoned, and chased out of from one place to another. That tells you he was passionate, he was bold in your face, and could be, quote-unquote, rude. Okay? So, anyway, praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, please forgive us. Forgive me. Forgive our imperfections, our shortcomings. Forgive us for succumbing to the flesh. Crucify our flesh. Fill us with power and self-control from your spirit, the fruit of your spirit, life from your spirit, to walk in holiness and purity and love. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, please anoint me to speak truth without error. Save me from st stammering and confusion. Bless your people with wisdom and knowledge from the spirit to understand the word of God and give us the power to live out the word, to proclaim the word, love the word, and even die for the word, Father. And Father, fill my lungs and my throat and my chest with life from your spirit, the health I need to glorify you and make my voice pleasing to the sound of the ears of your servants for your glory, Father. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover my children with the blood of Jesus, our loved ones, and fill us with the spirit. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way and bless this time in Jesus' name. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yehovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All right. We're going to continue our discussion. Uh, Bonnie, however your name is, if you ask me again, I have serious questions to ask you. Can I call you right to you? I'm going to have to mute you because you're now distracting. This is not the time to ask me whether you can ask me. I'm about to begin a topic, okay? Help me to help you ask questions that are relevant to the topic, right? By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Let's begin. We're going to discuss Hebrews 1 again. What is the purpose of these series? I'm going to provide irrefutable proof, sound exegesis of scriptures, demonstrating beyond any reasonable doubt, Jesus is not the spirit creature, the archangel Michael. Okay. Edward, nice knowing you, friend. Nice knowing you, sir. We were sailing along on the moon blind bay. All right. Coming back to the issue. I'm going to provide irrefutable proof from the sound exegesis of scriptures, 
Jesus is not the spirit creature called the Archangel Michael. He is God Almighty, Yahovah, Yahweh, if you want to say it, or Jehovah in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, but one with them in essence. Okay? That's what I'm going to demonstrate. And I'm going to use Hebrews 1 to demonstrate that for now. I began interpreting Hebrews 1 yesterday, so I'm going to continue where we left off. Are you guys with me now? Are you on board? Do you guys are if you're bored and if you're tired, let me know. I'll shut down because I'm here to serve you. Like I said, the Lord doesn't need me. I need the Lord. And if you don't want me to do it, I'll stop. Honestly. Right? It's a privilege and honor to be used of the Lord and for you guys to want to listen. Okay. Someone had left me a question in the comment section and told me, how do we know that the word of God, the word of Yehovah, the word of Jehovah, right? In those passages that we cited is referring to a person called the word and not to, let's say, God's command or his audible voice. Now, I thought I made a clear, compelling case that in those examples that we looked at, the word of Yehovah, the word of Jehovah, wasn't simply God's audible voice or a command from God or the written word, but a person sent from God who happens to be God. I thought I made the case clear. Was it clear yesterday? I don't know. Was it clear? Because that question frustrated me because either I was not clear or the person wasn't paying attention, right? But I'm going to do it again. I'm going to show you that the two places in particular show that the word here is not God's audible voice that you hear. It's not a command from God, and it's not the written word. It's a person, okay? I'm going to show you two examples again. Are you ready? And then we can move on. Are you ready? Are you ready for that? Okay. Thank our brother, Protestant believer, who will be posting. Lord bless him for helping us. Ken, I got to send you on your merry way, my brother. Ken, see you later, friend. Nice knowing you, sir. Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. Okay. Genesis 15, verses 4 to 6. Okay, let's read it. Watch here. And behold, the word of Yahovah came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Now notice, the word of Yahovah came unto him. Now some translations won't have the word saying. Whether it has it or not, it's irrelevant. Now what's the proof that this word that came from God is not his audible voice or a command or the written word, but a person? Here's the proof. Let's read it again. Read it with me, folks. And behold, the word of Yahovah came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Here's the proof. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Verse 6, and he believed in Yahovah, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Verse 5, one more time. Verse 5, one more time. Here's how we know this word is a person. This word is not God's audible voice or command, but a person sent by God to speak to Abraham. And I'm going to give you the modern English version so you understand. Here you go, so you can see. Here's the modern English version of verse 5. Okay. Guys, read with me, please. I need your attention. He brought him outside and said, look, did you catch it? He brought Abraham outside. Who's he? Verse 4 tells you. The word that came to Abraham took him outside, meaning the word is inside the tent where Abraham's living, and takes him outside. How can this be the audible voice of God or a command of God when the word is inside the tent and takes him outside? That tells you that the word is a person who's appearing visibly in a specific area. Do you see it?
Do you see it or no? Before I move on, I want to make sure you catch it. So it's not the audible voice of God. It's not the command of God. It's not the written word. It's a person called the word sent to appear visibly at a specific location. He's inside and takes them out. That word becomes Jesus Christ. Second example, Jeremiah 1, verses 4 to 10. But we're going to take it section by section. Do me a favor, Protestant believer. Post Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5. Jeremiah 1, verses 4 and 5. We're going to break it down. Then the word of Yahovah came unto me, saying. Now, some translations don't have the word saying. That's irrelevant. You don't need the word saying. You just need to know the context. Then the word of Yahovah came unto me. So the word came before I formed thee in the belly. So the word is saying, I formed you, Jeremiah, in the belly. I'm your creator. But before I did that, I already knew you, meaning I already decided to create you. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I already sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. So notice it's the word speaking to Jeremiah. I created you. But even before I created you, I already decreed I was going to make you my prophet and set you apart from birth for my glory. Okay? Now, how do we know this is not simply God's audible voice or command, but an actual person called the Word? Now, read with me 6 to 9. 6 to 9. Read with me. Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10. We're going to read 6 to 9. Then we're going to include 11 in a minute. Then said I, Ah, Adonai Yehovah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord, Yehovah, said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Don't say you're a child. I'll be with you. I'll tell you what to say, and you say what I command you. Now read 8 9. Be not afraid of their faces. For I am with thee to deliver thee, saith Yehovah. So the word is God. God is the word. The word is Jehovah. He belongs to Jehovah and he's Jehovah. Notice he's the word of Jehovah who's called Jehovah. Now notice verse 9. Then Yehovah put forth his hand and touched my mouth. Do you need any clear proof that this word is God appearing in visible form? The word is not simply God's voice, God's command but a person who appears to the prophets in visible form whom they know to be Jehovah. Do you see it? The Lord put forth his hand. So here's God in visible form. He has a form in which Jeremiah sees her hand, and he knows that's the hand of Yehovah. And the hand of Yehovah touched in my mouth. And Yehovah said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Could it be any clearer? Just want to make sure. Could it be any clearer that here the word of Yahovah is identified as God who appears visibly in human form face to face with Jeremiah. And in that visible form, Jeremiah sees the, the hand of the word who is Yahovah touching him. You catch it? You're not missing much first last. I'm just reviewing. The first 20 minutes was just asking questions, showing people why they need to know the Bible more than they need to know about Islam and why it's false. You're catching it? Now let's make it clear. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 11. Then I'm going to give you some extra biblical Jewish sources and one particular writing that's accepted as scripture. Yes, medic, that's what I just said. Medic, pay attention. You got to get this so you can represent the argument correctly. The word of Yahovah is Yahovah. The word of God is God because it says, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So this word belongs to God and he is God. This word belongs to Jehovah and he is Jehovah because Jehovah and his word, they're distinct persons that exist as one God. That's why Jeremiah can call him Jehovah. Abraham can call him Jehovah. Right? Okay, Jeremiah 1, 9 to 11. Go ahead, Protestant believer. Post it again. Keep praying that I get healthier 
get bolder, get holier, become more loving, compassionate, and patient. And Lord, provide for me and my children. Okay, Jeremiah 1, 9 to 11. You posted 11. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 11. You posted 11. Sorry about that, brother. I know it's tiring for you too. It's got to be tiring for this guy posting verses. Read with me. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 11. Then Yahovah the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahovah the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, to throw down, to build, and to plant. Now notice verse 11. Moreover, the word of Yahovah came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an, of an almond tree. Did you catch it? Who is Jehovah, who is appearing in visible form with an outstretched hand that touches the mouth of Jeremiah? Who is this Jehovah that did it? Who is the Je Jehovah that appeared to him? Was it the Father? Was it the Spirit? Who appeared to him? What is the name given to him in the text? The word, thank you. Could it be any clearer, folks, that in these examples, the word of Yahovah is not simply God's audible voice or God's command or the written word, that in these cases, the word of the Lord is a person of God sent by God to appear visibly to commission the prophets and empower them. Okay, now, just to prove to you, just to prove to you that this isn't something that we Christians came up with. We invented, but even the Jews. Now, this is where I need your undivided attention, folks. Even the Jews before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, and after Christ, from their reading of the Old Testament, saw this figure in their Bible. Did you know that the Jews before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ, after the time of Christ, from reading the Hebrew Bible, recognize that this word that we're reading about is a person who is God, distinct from God, sent by God to speak to the prophets? And I'm going to prove it to you. When you have time, Google the name Philo, P-H-I-L-O of Alexandria. Philo of Alexandria was an Alexandrian Jew living in Alexandria, Egypt, who wrote about the Jewish faith to Greeks using Greek philosophy to communicate the truth of the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish faith. He was a contemporary of Christ and Paul, Philo of Alexandria. In his writings, he mentions, guys, I need your attention here. He mentions the Logos. The Greek word for word. You know, John wrote in Greek, right? And John in Greek writes, in the beginning was halogos. Hologos. Halagos. And halagos was with God and halagos was God. Before John wrote that, Philo already spoke of the logos, the word. And you know what he said about the word? He said the word is the high priest who sits on God's throne, the chief of all angels, who's the second God, who's not created but not uncreated because he was begotten by God. Philo knew all this before John wrote John, and he knew this because of the Hebrew Bible. Are you with me there? Philo of Alexandria. Now I'm going to give you this link. Let me post the link again. Okay. This link is to the English translation of what is known as the Targumim. Targumim, the Targums. What are the Targums? The Targums are Aramaic translations, Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament done by Jews. When the Jews could no longer read or write Hebrew, but read and wrote Aramaic and Greek, Jewish scholars translated the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic for those Jews who couldn't read or write Hebrew, but only were able to read and write Aramaic. And for those Jews who couldn't even read Aramaic, a group of Jewish scholars translated the Old Testament into Greek. So for Greek-speaking Jews 
they produced a Greek translation of the Old Testament. For those Jews who could only read and write Aramaic but not Hebrew, they produced an Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Aramaic translation of the Hebrew Bible is called the Targumim, Targums, which is an Aramaic word. The word Targum in Aramaic means translation, interpretation. Here is the link to the English translation of these Targums. Well, no, it would be roughly contemporary. Oh, here we go again. Hater Wood. Hater Wood. Talk about insomnia. One look at him and he knocks you out for weeks. Thank God for Hater Wood. He cures insomnia. Okay, now, follow with me. The Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament and the Greek translation were done before the time of Christ. Are you with me here? The Aramaic translation paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible and the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible were done before the time of Christ by the Jews, not Christians. Everyone with me? Here's the link again. Because now I'm going to read some citations of the Aramaic Targum. And you tell me what you think. Yes, we found Aramaic paraphrases in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yep. Now, you guys ready? Thank the Lord for Anthony Rogers' article because he saved me so much time and effort. I'm going to post the link here because he quotes the Targums in his article in his exposition of Genesis 19.24. Here you go. Genesis 19.24. Guys, are you ready for me to cite from the Targums? Are you ready? Do I have your attention? Are you bored? Because David is here and put you to sleep. Let's read. These are Jews, mind you. This comes from Targum Neophyti. Neophyti. <laughs> Try to pronounce that. <laughs> Neophyti. Neophyti. This is the Targum called Targum Neophyti. Neophyti. Oh, la, 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 la. Anyway. Genesis 28. This is now the Aramaic translation of Genesis 28 by the Jews. Guys, pay attention. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If the Memra of Yahweh. Memra is the Aramaic word for word. Memra in Aramaic means word. Logos in Greek means word. The Hebrew word is dabar or davar. Okay. Okay. The Aramaic word from which we get the term word is memra. Memra. Okay. Now let me read how the Jews translated Genesis 28. This is the Jewish translation of Genesis 28 into Hebrew. Read with me. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If the memra of Yahweh will be my support. Notice what he did not say. If Yahweh will be my sword. No. If the word of Yahweh will be my support and will keep me. Who will keep me? The word keeps me. If he keeps me in the way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the word of Yahweh be my God. What? Jacob says that if the word saves me, protects me, then that word will be my God. The Memra will be my God. Did it sink in? Did you catch it or no? Let me quote the last part. Did it sink in or no? Watch here. Here you go. Where did the Jews come up with the notion that Jacob was referring to the word of Jehovah as his God. Where did the Jews come to the realization that God had a word who was his messenger, a distinct person from him, whom he sent to the patriarchs to strengthen them? And where did they get the notion that the patriarchs and the prophets knew about this word and knew this word was their creator and their God? They're not Christians, folks, and they were not reading the Gospel of John. 
They were not reading the Gospel of John. Where did they get it from? The Hebrew Bible. They got it from the Old Testament. And I'll explain the significance in a minute. Now watch here. This comes from the fragmentary Targum on Exodus 3. Exodus 3. Guys, Exodus 3 is the angel of Jehovah who speaks to Moses. But let me read it. And the memra of the Lord said to Moshe. Who spoke to Moshe? The word. Said to Moshe, he who spake to the world be, and it was, and who will speak to it be, and it will be. And he said, thus shalt thou speak to the sons of Israel. Ehye has sent me unto you. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me the Jews who translated Exodus 3 into Aramaic identified the angel of God as the word of God? So they saw the angel as the word, the word as the angel? That the angel of God is the word of God. They're the same person. Here it goes. Memra is the Aramaic term for word. Are you catching it or no? Do you caught it or no? Let me give you a couple more. Targum Ankelos on Genesis 20. Targum Ankelos on Genesis 20. Watch here. Read this. I can post this. Read this, folks. I'm going to post it again. Read. And the word came from the presence of the Lord to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, wait, 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 wait. Who came to Abimelech in Genesis 20? Who rebuked Abimelech for trying to sleep with Sarah in Genesis 20? Genesis 20 says Jehovah did. The Aramaic Targum says the word did. Genesis 20 in the Hebrew, it's Jehovah. In the Aramaic, it's the word. The word came to him and warned him. There it goes. Read it. I just posted it. One more time. Right? Are you catching this or no? I'll give you a few more examples. Right? Here is Targum Ankelos, Genesis 3. Let's see if I can put post this all. Watch here, folks. Exactly, Mickey. Watch here, folks. Let me post it again. The Aramaic translation of Genesis 3. And they heard the voice of the memra of the Lord God. Bam. Who was walking in the garden with Adam and Eve? The Jews said, the word of God. The memra of God was walking, not God the Father. There you go. And here, and they heard the voice of the memra of the Lord God walking in the garden in the evening of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from before the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Here's another one. Fragmentary Targum. On Genesis 3, I'm going to break it down into two parts. Fragmentary Targum, here goes. Read the first part. And the memra of the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Behold, the world which I have created is manifest before me. Wait, 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 wait. Genesis 3, the Jews said it was the word, the memra, who said to Adam, Adam, the whole world which I created is manifest before me. How do you think you're able to hide from me? Yes, Psalms. It was the word of God walking physically. Here you go. There it goes. Now let's quote the second part. The second part. Fragmentary tar Targum, Genesis 3. Now I can give you so many more, more but we're going to limit it to this one. It's all in that article. Okay, now read the second part with me. And how thinkest thou, the word now is telling Adam, Adam, I'm the word, and I created the world, and the word I created is manifest before me. How thinkest thou, what made you think that the place in the midst whereof thou art is not revealed before me, whereas the commandment which I taught thee? Did you catch what he's saying? What makes you think you can hide from me, Adam? Don't you know who I am? I am the word who is God that created the world. The whole world is manifest before me. What makes you think you can hide from me? 
Did it sink in yet or no? Did it sink in? So here's the link to the Targums that you can read for yourself. Go here, save the link. I'll put it in the description box. Okay. Malach means angel. Mamra means word. Here it goes. Save it. And here's Anthony Rogers' article where he gives you these citations. So if you don't want to look it up for yourself, here you go. Save it. Okay. Is it clear that the Jews long before John knew from the Hebrew Bible because they saw these passages? You with me there? The passages I showed you, they're just some of many. The Jews reading that same Old Testament saw the same thing we're seeing. There is a word sent by God that's not God's voice. It's not God's command. It's not the written word, but a per person, a spiritual entity sent by God to appear to the prophets and patriarchs as God in visible form who happens to be one with God. Do you see that? And did you see how the Aramaic paraphrase identified the word of the Lord as the angel of the Lord in Exodus 3? The angel of the Lord is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is the angel of the Lord. Is that clear? Because I'm going to give you one final one. I'm going to read this. I'm not going to tell you where it's from. I'm going to read this. I'm not going to tell you where it's from, but I'm going to read it, right? You tell me where this is from. Okay? Watch here. Why did this work? Hmm. Sorry. Hold on. Okay, you ready? Are you ready for me to read it? Okay, pay attention. For though they had disbelieved everything because of their ma magic art. It's not about Egypt. It's not about Pharaoh. It's not about the magicians. It's not about the Egyptians. And the time of Moses when he's about to bring the Israelites out. Okay, that's the context. For though they had disbelieved everything because of their magic arts... Yet, when their firstborn were destroyed, when their firstborn were destroyed, killed, they acknowledged your people, Israel, your people to be God's child, the Son of God. Now watch this. For a while, gentle silence enveloped all things. It was silent at night. And night in its swift course was now half gone. Your all-powerful word, God, your all-powerful word, leaped from heaven, jumped out of heaven, from the royal throne, from that throne, into the midst of the land that was doomed, a stern war warrior carrying your all-powerful word, carrying the sharp sword of your authentic command, and stood, the word now stood, and filled all things with death. The word of God with his sword killed the Egyptians, and he was so tall he touched heaven while standing on the earth. Let me post this. Let me post this. Okay. Read it. Your all powerful word leaped from heaven from the royal throne. So this writer knows that with God on the throne is his almighty word. Your word is almighty. Into the midst of the land that was doomed, a stern warrior. Okay. I'm really tempted to ban this guy running for the crown because I wanted to help others to see where is this from. Because I think this guy's trying to get attention, right? But it's okay. Let's see. I'm going to test him out. Let's see how last he's going to how long he's going to last. Everyone here, where is this from? Stephen Martyr? Hmm. Where is this from? Okay, good, good, good. See, the Orthodox and the Catholic got it. The Orthodox and the Catholic got it. 
It's in the wisdom of Solomon. Okay, sorry, brother. Go ahead. I thought, all right, I apologize. I guess you knew him. Okay, sorry. It's the wisdom of Solomon, a Jewish book written before the time of Christ, which the Orthodox and the Catholics accept as scripture, as do the Coptics. Here's the link. Did you catch it? Here's the link. The wisdom of Solomon, what the Protestants called Apocrypha, what the Catholics call Deuterocanonical, this Jewish book written by Jews before the time of Christ attributed to Solomon, Jewish book written by Jews before the time of Christ attributed to Solomon, and yet this Jewish book knows that on the throne with God, on the throne with God is the all-powerful word of God who comes down from the throne in visible form and has a sword to kill God's enemies and save his people. How did he know that? No. Forget about it. Forget about Super Chat. How did this Jewish source before the Gospel of John before the New Testament, how did this Jew or Jews know that on the throne of God is the all-powerful word of God who comes down in visible form to slay God's enemies and save his people? How? Are you guys bored with this yet? Did I put you to sleep? How did he know? Tell me, how did he know? Now, if you believe it's inspired scripture because the Spirit inspired it to him. But for those of you, for those of you who don't believe it's inspired scripture, how would the Jew or the Jews that produce this know? Wisdom of Solomon is one of those books that the Jews today don't accept and Protestants don't accept medic for Christ. But the Catholics, the Roman, the Roman Catholics, the Orthodox, the Coptics accept it as scripture. It's an Old Testament, what we call apocryphal writing, attributed to Solomon. If you believe it's scripture, how do they know? You know how they knew? The same way that Philo of Alexandria knew. The same way the Jews that produced the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament knew. The way they knew it is because it's in the Hebrew Bible. It's in the 39 Old Testament books that we all accept. That's what you need to see. Philo knew it because he knew the Old Testament and he saw it there. The Jews that translated the Old Testament into Aramaic knew it because they saw it in the Old Testament. They saw it was there. They knew their Old Testament. This wisdom of Solomon knew it because he's reflecting on the Old Testament, studying the Old Testament, and saw it there. You with me there? Running for the crown. You're going to get a second warning. Stop posting verses here that are not relevant to the topic. 1 Kings 22, 19 is talking about Jehovah on the throne, surrounded by the heavenly council. Is Isaiah 6, same thing, surrounded by the seraphim. Ezekiel 1, same thing by the cherubim. Don't help me, brother. Stop. Stop challenging me, brother. If you want to learn, sit back, relax. Take a chill pill. For the rest of you who are serious and want to learn, did you catch it? How did Philo know? How did the Jews that translated the Old Testament Aramaic know? How does this book, The Wisdom of Solomon, how did, how did those composers or composer know? How do they know? How do they know? Because it's in the Old Testament. Now, you know what that means? You know what that means? John did not introduce anything new in John 1. John wasn't the first one who came up with, there's an eternal word who is a person distinct from God the Father, an eternal fellowship with God the Father who then created all things and spoke to the prophets. John did not invent that. In other words, if you were living at the time of John and you said to a Jew who knew his faith, you said to a Jew who knew his faith, 
Hey, did you know in the beginning was the word? They'll say, yeah, I know that. You know this word was with God? Yeah. And you know this word was God? Tell me something I don't know, John. You know that word, create all things? John, I know this. Why are you bothering me? They would have known this already. The only thing that would have been new is when John said the word became flesh, became a human being. That's when the Jews would say, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Hold on. Wait. What do you mean the word became flesh? Yeah, it became flesh. You're saying that word that we read about in the Old Testament, the word who appeared to Adam and Eve, the word who spoke to Abraham, the word who commissioned Moses and Jeremiah and strengthened them and saved them and fought for them, the word who's distinct from God, sent by God, who's a divine person, he became flesh? Yeah. Who is he? Jesus of Nazareth. Whoa. John, you're telling me, you're telling us, the one that we nailed to the cross, the one that we handed over to the, to the Romans to kill, who was beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, buried, that's that word? Yes. And he's not dead. He's alive. He's conquered death, and he can never die again. The word is now known as Jesus of Nazareth. Not that he had a physical body, Cruz. No, you're not getting the point. He appeared in visible form. He appeared in human form, but he didn't become an actual physical flesh and blood human being until he entered the blessed womb of his blessed virgin mother, who then conceived his physical body and human nature by the power of the Holy Spirit while she was a virgin. Yes. For those of you who want to support, because this brother saying support, you can do so on Patreon, but contact me. Because I can use the support to do ministry for the glory of Christ if you feel that's what God wants me to do. If not, don't worry about it. Is that clear? The wisdom book would have written, been written around 200 years before the time of Christ, Douglas. About 200 years before the time of Christ. Right? So are you, do you see the clear evidence from Jewish sources written before, during, and after the time of Christ where these Jews are not Christians? See that there is a messenger of God, a person sent by God, who is God called the Word. Do you see it? Number one means yes. That's a code word, M. One means yes. Two means no. Do you see it? One, yes. Do you see it? Two, no. That helps me to help you to make sure you're not confused. Is that clear? If we got this out of the way, is it clear Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 2 is saying that God the Father spoke to the prophets and through the prophets to the Israelites through various ways, two of which included speaking to the prophets by the word and by the spirit. I established that yesterday, right? And simply refreshing your minds about the word. So Jesus the word was one of the ways that God the Father spoke through the prophets. And the Holy Spirit as well was another way that God the Father spoke through the prophets. And if you want the evidence, watch part three, which is now on my page, which I did yesterday, because I want to now move on. Is it clear so far? I want to move on to the next point. Because what's the point using Hebrews 1 to decimate the argument that Jesus is the archangel Michael? And by the way, Lord willing, this is going to be my last session till Monday. Because this weekend I'm very busy doing pre-recorded shows. So pray for the anointing filled with the Spirit. I'm doing pre-recorded shows on Christianity Islam. They'll be airing on Al Fadi TV soon. So this weekend I'll be busy. I won't be back, Lord willing, until Monday. So let's make the most of it, right? Let's go out with a bang. <laughs> Folks, let me let you in on a little secret where I need you guys to pray for me. Here, I just want to let you know. As I'm speaking from my heart because you guys are regulars. I know you love me, and you won't use things to slander me, discredit me. And if you do, you'll answer to the Lord. Do you know there are times in which, and today is one of them, where I feel like I'm not called to ministry. I should just walk away. 
disappear in silence and just find some secular job and just serve the Lord and just walk away. There's sometimes I feel like that. You know that? And today is one of those days. Yep, no, I'm being honest. I just sometimes I just feel like obviously I'm not worthy to do it. And at times I feel like I'm too impatient and I get frustrated too quick. And maybe I just need to walk away because, again, the Lord doesn't need me. But so pray about that, right? Just pray about it because, I, you know, it happens. Um, and today was one of those days, right? One of those days. So I'm just open it up because you're my family. If you really love me for the sake of the Lord, you let me be honest with you about slander because there are people, sons of Satan, who use this to attack me. God deal with them, right? But anyway, let's continue. Yeah, I'm, I, I know, Protestant. Now, one thing, I truly do love your prayers and your encouraging words. But let me tell you something. I pray that I never get puffed up. God crucifies my flesh and destroys my pride. But I'm being honest with you. Even though I receive feedback from you brothers and sisters telling me you believe God has anointed me and has blessed me to teach, it still doesn't penetrate. Let me just be upfront. It doesn't penetrate. I appreciate it. I love your encouragement, but it doesn't sink in. That's just my issue. This is my struggle, my thorn in the side, right? I believe God allows all of us to have a thorn in our side to keep us humble so we don't get puffed up. This happens to be my thorn, right? My thorn is lack of self-worth, low self-esteem, loneliness for companionship. But his will be done. He is my God. He is my Lord. He is my life, Father, Son, and Spirit. And I pray I will glorify him even in death. So just share that with you guys, all right? Just want to be open with you. It's one of those days, one of those hard days today, right? Even though I may come off strong, bold, even arrogant, no, that's, that's the Holy Spirit emboldening me. Because anyway, God is good. Love you guys. Now, with that said, with that said, Let's continue unpacking Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Let's read Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. All right. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Let's read it. Guys, now let's focus. Let's focus. Let's unpack it. I, sh I should be able to at least deal with Hebrews 1, verses 2 to 5. Let's see. Yeah, and I have no idea what that means. I don't know what this guy's talking about. Scratching, don't get caught because you're going to need patching. What the heck is this stone kisser talking about? I have no idea. I don't know if he's even a Christian. I guess he is. Okay. All right, Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Yeah. Remember, Douglas, let me put in perspective. Not doubt about God. I have absolutely no doubt God is real. Jesus is real. He's alive. The Bible is his word. It's me. Yeah, you know. And by the way, let me encourage you to watch. If you want to talk about attacks on people in, in the front line, David Wood just came out with a video yesterday. It's 21 minutes. Apologizing to Muslims. You have to watch it. If after you watch that video, you complain about your problems, right? Then I'm going to say, unless you were going through what he went through, if you want to see a person being attacked and going through hell because he's in ministry, watch the video and you're going to see how vicious the onslaught by the kingdom of darkness is. David Wood is suffering. I'm suffering and nowhere near on his level, but me too. Why ex-wife, infidelity, children, court, you name it. Every one of us is being attacked because Satan wants to take us out and distract us. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Acts 17 apologetics. Go there. You'll see it. David Wood. Hebrews 1, 2 to 3. Let's finish. See? Love like Christ. You see? See? Exactly. And, and I can tell you, everyone in ministry is suffering to some extent. Some worse than others. Now notice, the Father in these last days, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. We're going to focus on verse 3, folks. Verse 3, read with me. No, I can't. Desperate Islam. No, I can't. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, post verse 3 again, and I'm going to post it in a different version, because this is going to be decimation, annihilation of these heretics and cultists like Greg Stafford, who even misuse this passage to teach something else. Ironically, okay, watch here. Hebrews 1, verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Good to see you, bro. I hope these sessions are blessing you. Guys, I'm going to post it in the new revised standard version. Here you go. Read with me. I'm going to post it again. I'm going to post it three times because if you just remember one argument, remember this. If you just remember one argument, someone needs attention because he's excited. He needs attention. We won't mention his name, Idiotai. He needs attention. Here, read with me. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint, exact imprint of God's very own being. Did you catch it? Let me post it again. Okay, I'm not going to move on until you catch it. Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of God's very own being. If you just remember this one argument, you will annihilate this blasphemous lie that Jesus is the Archangel Michael. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, you ready now? The Greek word is character, where we get the word character. Exact imprint. Okay. Exact imprint is the Greek word character. Okay. Guys, you got to get this. Some of you already know it. For those who don't, you got to get this. The word character can mean exact imprint, exact copy, exact duplicate, exact representation. Okay. Notice it says Jesus is the exact imprint of God's being, substance, being. Okay, folks, here's where I need your undivided attention. It's God's being uncreated. Is God's being uncreated? Is God's being infinite? Is God's being infinite? All right. And isn't it an essential part of God's being? The being of God includes specific attributes such as omnipotence, being all-powerful. God's being also includes the attribute of omniscience, all-knowing. God's being also includes being omnipresent. So the being of God is uncreated, infinite. The being of God Includes characteristics such as omnipotence, all power, omniscience, all knowing, omnipresence, the entire creation is present before him, right? You with me there? You with me there? But now let me ask you a question. Hebrew says Christ is the exact imprint exact copy exact representation exact duplicate of god's being how can a finite temporal limited creature be the exact imprint of god's infinite eternal uncreated being now let me show you how the Jehovah's witness bible translates this Let me show you how the Jehovah Witness Bible translates this, all right? Because this point you got to remember. Here you go. Here you go. Hebrews 1, verse 3. I'm going to give you the link. Here's the link. Click on that link. Here it is. Watch here. 
Look how even this perverted Bible renders the Greek. Guys, catch it. Here you go. I'm going to post it several times. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. That's the Jehovah Witness Bible, folks. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact representation of his very being. Bam! Even the Jehovah Witness perversion of the Bible, even Jehovah Witnesses perversion of the Bible had to render the Greek word character as exact representation of his very being. Wow. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. Uh, Mr. Jehovah Witness, Jesus is the Archangel Michael, right? Yes. He's a creature, right? Yes. He's limited, right? Yeah. But in your translation, Jesus is the exact representation of God's very being. God's being is uncreated, right? Yes. Eternal? Yes. Infinite? Yes. And part of God's being includes that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, present ever. Yes. You just buried yourself. Because the Archangel Michael cannot be the exact representation of God's being. For Jesus to be the exact representation of God's being, Christ must be uncreated, eternal, infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere. Otherwise, he's not the exact imprint, exact representation. Thank you, John and Inc. One. Keep praying for the health, the support, the holiness, and for my daughters. Did you catch it? But now I'm going to bury it further. You want to find further hum humiliation? According to Joe's witnesses, Jesus is the Archangel Michael. And as the Archangel Michael, he's one of the sons of God and one of the gods in heaven. That's what they believe. Are you with me there? Are you with me there? According to the Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus, as the Archangel Michael, is one of the heavenly sons of God and one of the gods in heaven. All right. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. 86, 8 to 10. Oops, sorry. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. Read with me, folks. Okay. Okay. Psalm 86, 8 to 10. Okay. Read with me. Among the gods, there is none like unto thee, O Lord. Among the gods, there is no one like you, O Lord. Neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. All right. See this guy, this filthy dog, pretending that he wants to be a Christian and study. What is the bald guy talking about? Hold on. All right. Read with me. Okay, wait, read with me. And then verse 10. For thou art great and doest wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Now, guys, here is the Jehovah Witness translation of Psalm 86.8. There is none like you among the gods, O Jehovah. Here's their translation. There's none like you among the gods, O Jehovah. There you go. Here's their translation. Oh, but it's going to get worse. <whistles> Guys, pay attention. Here's the link to their translation. There's none like you among the gods, O Jehovah. There's none like you among the gods, O Jehovah. Right, did you catch it? Is there any god like Jehovah according to the psalm? Anyone like him? Psalm 89, 5 to 8. Psalm 89, 5 to 8. Guys, pay attention. Here's the knockout. Here is the decimation of Joe's Witnesses and Greg Stafford, that cult leader. Psalm 89, six, 5 to 8. 5 to 8. Read. 5 to 8. Psalm 89, 5 to 8. 
The heavens praise your marvels, O Jehovah. Yes, your faithfulness in the congregation of the only ones. Notice verse 6. For who in the skies can compare to Jehovah? Who among the sons of God is like Jehovah? Wait, this is the New World Translation. Psalm 89.6 in the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Who among the sons of God in heaven is like Jehovah? No one. God is held in awe in the council of holy ones. He is grand and awe-inspiring to all who are around him. Jehovah of God of armies, who is mighty like you, O Jah? Your faithless surrounds you. Wow. The Job Witness translation of Psalm 89, 5-8 says, No son of God in heaven, none of the sons of God in heaven, are like Jehovah or mighty like Jehovah. Whoa. Wait, 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 wait. Job Witness, hold on. Yeah. Is Jesus the archangel Michael? Yes. Is he in heaven? Yes. Is he one of the sons of God in heaven? Yes. Is he one of these gods in heaven? Yes. So according to Psalm 89, 5 to 8, is there any son of God in heaven like Jehovah? None. You just buried yourself, Jehovah Witness. Why? Hebrews 1, 3 in your Bible says, Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. Bam. You just proved he's not the archangel Michael. He's not a spirit creature, an angelic spirit creature, an angelic created son of God. He must be God Almighty. Bam! Your own Bible just destroyed you. These are in my articles on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. Answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. And my series showing that Jesus is not Jehovah, it's all there. You caught it? Now let me give you the link. Here's six again. Post Psalm 89, six one more time. Psalm 89, verse six, one more time. For who in the skies can compare Jehovah? Who among the sons of God is like Jehovah? Okay, folks, now let's look at Hebrews 1, 3 in the Job Witness Bible one more time. Thank Protestant Believer for posting one more time. They don't have a counter argument. There is only one, and it has to do with Hebrews 1, 3, and I'll try to show you what it is and how stupid that argument is. Now, here is the New World Translation of Job's Witnesses, Hebrews 1, 3. Read it. He is the reflection of God's glory, the exact representation of his very being. End of story. No creature, no angelic creature, not even Michael, can be the exact imprint representation of Jehovah's being because Jehovah's being is uncreated, eternal, infinite. And part of Jehovah's being includes Jehovah being all-powerful, all-knowing, present everywhere, which Michael cannot be because he's a finite, limited, temporal creature. And Psalm 86, Psalm 89 said, None of the sons of God in heaven are like Jehovah or mighty, mighty like him. But Jesus is exactly like Jehovah God the Father and just as mighty as Jehovah God the Father because Hebrews 1.3 says Jesus sustains all creation by his powerful word. Hmm. Let it sink in. Chan, never been to Bible college, never been to seminary, Never been to university, university. The highest education is a GED. Why do I tell you? So you can see how amazing, how powerful, how real the triumph God is, that God will give you wisdom to confound scholars if you submit to the Spirit and let the Spirit fill you. I am proof of it. By worldly standards, I'm an idiot, a fool to be rejected. And God chooses the foolish things of this world to humble the wise men of this age for the glory of the triumph God. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 29. You catch it now? Coming from Andrew Martin, it blesses my heart. Because he's still an atheist, but he's on his way to worship Jesus. May the Lord Jesus bring you to his feet, Andrew. 
so I can be with you forever in heaven worshiping Jesus. Pray for him. Okay. Now, if I, an uneducated, I, an uneducated fool, unworthy, can be given this wisdom and boldness to glorify the triune God, how much more can you do if you believe and have no doubt and trust the Holy Spirit of the Father and the Son? Now, did you understand how you can use Hebrews 1.3 to decimate the Jehovah Witness and this cult leader, Greg Stafford, in proving Jesus can't be a creature if he's the exact imprint of God's being? Was that clear? Now, I'll give you an objection that these heretics use in desperation. Are you ready? Amen. I, I discourage you to go to seminary or Bible college. You're going to go to school. Go to school to get a secular degree in some field to fall on financially. And all you do is pray to the Holy Spirit to guide you to understand the Bible and to the right teachers. Because you live in a time where all this information is here for free. It's a fingertip away. Just don't be lazy and be disciplined to listen to these long messages and read. Are you now ready for the objection so we can decimate the objection? And then, Lord willing, I'll be back Monday. Are you ready now? Guess what the argument is, uh, the counter argument is. You ready for the counter argument? Here's the counter. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Character, exact representation, refers to a copy. And we know a copy can't be as old as the original. A copy is later. That's their argument. <laughs> All right. Let, let, let's, let me repeat the argument again. The word character means a copy. Yeah, it's an exact copy, but we know a copy is later than the original. So Jesus can't be eternal because he's a copy. He's later. Yeah, like a Xerox copy. Now, you know how you shred and decimate that argument? You know how you shred and decimate that argument? Do you know how you shred and decimate that argument? Number one, it is true. It is true that when you speak of temporal things, things that are part of the temporal order, space, matter, time, a copy is later in time. Because that's just the nature of the temporal order of creation. So if there is a copy of something that exists in the temporal realm, in time, space, and place, then yes, the copy is later. You can't avoid it, right? However, we're not talking of a copy of a temporal entity, of a temporal being. We're talking of the exact copy of an infinite eternal being. When you speak of an eternal being, time goes out the window. So when I say Christ is exact copy of God's being, time cannot be part of the meaning of the word because if Christ is later, he can't be the exact copy of an eternal being because an eternal being for it to have any an exact copy, the copy must be eternal. Otherwise, it's not an exact copy. I'm going to repeat it again. It is true when you talk about temporal realities, things within the temporal realm, within time, space, and place that are created and bound to time, a copy will be later. But where does Hebrews 1 say Jesus is the exact copy of a temporal being, of a temporal entity, of a temporal reality? It says Jesus is the exact copy of God's being. Last time I checked, God's being is not part of time, space, or place. It's not a temporal reality. It does not exist in the temporal realm. God's being transcends time space and place, it's atemporal, it's eternal. 
Well, you can't have an exact copy of a being that's eternal if that entity is created because a temporal finite creature cannot be the exact copy of an eternal being. So when you talk about God's being, throw out time, my friend. Time, temporality is not included in the definition of character when you're speaking of Christ as the exact copy of the being of God, a being that's eternal. So that exact copy has to be eternal. Otherwise, he's not an exact copy. You get it? You see how stupid, desperate, foolish, satanic they are to try to impose temporality on the meaning of the term? Yes, it's true. Everything else, if it's a copy, it's later in time because we are part of time, space, and place. We are temporal realities. We can't help it but be bound to time. But who says that Hebrews is talking about temporal realities? He's talking about the being of God. Last time I checked, God's being is atemporal. It transcends temporal reality, transcends time, space, and place. So for Christ to be the exact copy of a being that's eternal, he can't be a temporal creature that comes later. Otherwise, he's not the exact copy. The very fact they have to argue that shows how desperate, pathetic, foolish, wicked, and demonic they are, which is why the true triune God raises up soldiers to shame and expose them for what they are. Is that clear? Folks, I've given you more than enough evidence in these last sessions. Jesus cannot be the spirit creature, Archangel Michael. He has to be God Almighty. Eternally God, infinitely God, one with the Father and the Spirit, which is why we're Trinitarians. Okay? With that said, it's over an hour. Lord willing, I won't be on this weekend because I'll have a busy weekend. So here's how you can pray for me. I'm going to be doing 26 pre-recorded shows Saturday and Sunday for Al-Fadi TV on Christian Islam. Here's, here's how you can pray for me. This is what I need you to pray. Pray God will fill me, not just for this weekend, forever until Jesus takes me. Pray God will fill my daughters, my precious nine-year-old and six-year-old, that God will fill them, fill them with joy, love, and peace, keep them perfectly healthy, that the Lord Jesus will provide for them overabundantly. The Lord Jesus will provide for me financially to raise them, that he'll bring them to me sooner than later. Pray God fights for me in this court and saves me for his glory to do ministry for his glory. Pray God helps me to get my health back. I'm losing weight to keep losing it to get healthier. Pray God makes me radically holy in love with Jesus, filled with the fruit of the spirit. Pray God puts love in my heart for you guys to love you for the sake of Jesus. And pray that the Lord will cure my loneliness if he has a godly woman for me to make her known. There's one in my heart. Let the Lord let me know if it's her or not to then just move on. If it is, to then touch your heart and bring us together for his glory. Amen? I love you for the sake of Jesus. Christ has died. Christ was risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahuwah to the glory of God the Father. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Pray for me. And if you want to support me, contact me for the glory of Christ. Love you. Watch these videos. Pass them on. Use the material. We love you, Jesus. Amen.